Greetings. Uh, my name is George Shear. I'm the Executive Director of the Contemporary Arts Center in New Orleans. And I'm joined by Joe Kreider, Artistic Director of Flyaway Productions and Choreographer of The Weight Room, and Alana Odoms, Executive Director of the ACLU of Louisiana. This brief conversation is the first in a series of short presentations connecting artists with policymakers and activists. The CAC is developing these conversations in anticipation of spring 2021, when the CAC will present the large-scale public airless performance of Joe Kreider's work, The Weight Room. Even as we eagerly look towards next spring's presentations of exceptional contemporary art and performance, we cannot wait to do the pressing work of building community. Even in shutdown and quarantine, the work continues and the CAC seeks to be a convener and a catalyst by engaging the artistic policy and social justice efforts of our community. Biologically, this virus does not discriminate in who it infects. It does not recognize race, ability, age, geographic boundary, even prison wall. However, according to the Louisiana Department of Health, at the time of this recording, the state has suffered 1,103 deaths, of which nearly 60% are African Americans. As Reverend Barber makes it clear in a New York Times article from April 7th, it's not biological. Existing structural inequalities are going to shape the racial inequalities of this pandemic. Art has long been a form of representation, and its most salient power in our time is its capacity to make visible that which is invisible. In moments of crisis, we can fail to see what is right in front of us. And in a state with one of the highest rates of incarceration anywhere in the world, there is no group of people more invisible and presently in danger than our incarcerated citizenry. I am so pleased to have Alana and Joe in conversation, and I look forward to your reflections on this unprecedented moment its effects in our most marginalized communities and the role art can play in carceral justice. And before you begin, I just want to wish each of you and your families and all those watching much health, safety, and comfort. Um, Alana, it's so nice to meet you. Um, it's always an honor to be present with people who are actually doing the work of political change at the policy level and to be an artist um, in conversation with you. It's just very honoring for me. Um, just a little bit about myself. I am both a choreographer and a site artist. And that means that I make dances in very unlikely places, um, often on the sides of buildings and almost always off the ground. Um, I place dancers anywhere between two and 100 feet from ground level. And um, there's a thrill and a freedom to the work. There's a spectacle to the work. And um, someone said about my work, uh, uh, content Trump spectacle. And that was a really thrilling review that I got because while the work is spectacular, it's also deeply infused with an intersectional feminist lens. And that's been a commitment that I've made over you know, almost 30 years of dance making. Um, I work in collaboration with a lot of different artists and my process, it begins with an issue and then we find a site where that issue is speaking from and then we design a set and then we pull in uh, uh, composers. I've spent mm, 30 years uh, commissioning women composers because I feel like women's voices are underrepresented in the as a whole. Um, and then I work with of women as well. Um, we work with a multiracial group of dancers and um, the dancers are really primary collaborators in the work that I do. Um, I work a lot with steel and steel is a big partner of mine. I like that it's hard. I like that it's heavy. I also struggle with that. It makes my work very expensive. Um, the weight room, which I'll be talking about a little bit, is um, a set made out of steel objects. And um, so steel is one of my most beloved partners. Um, I've made dances about older homeless women. I've made dances about women who built the Bay Area's bridges. I've made dances about women impacted by sexual harassment before that word was even termed. Um, I like to think that my work is a part of a physical language that democratizes public space. Um, the work is almost always performed for free and trying to bring a pretty high level of art to people who can't afford to go into the theater or, um, uh, yeah. And um, I work a lot with oral histories. So I collect stories 
And then those stories form the, the basis of the arc of the choreographies that I create. In 2011, my husband was arrested and ended up serving several years in federal prison. And um, it was one of the hardest things that I have ever experienced in my life to go through the system as a woman with an incarcerated loved one. And I have committed as a result to creating a project called the Decarceration Trilogy, Dismantling the Prison Industrial Complex, One Dance at a Time. And there's three dances in the trilogy and the first of which is the weight room. And that's what I'll be talking a little bit about with you as this conversation continues. Joe, wow. Uh, all I can say is I am so incredibly impressed with the way that you've chosen to use the platform of dance to highlight important uh, issues and problems facing our world. And incarceration is one of those pressing problems uh, in the state of Louisiana, but moreover in this country. And the fact that you speak from a directly impacted person's perspective is really empowering, I think, for so many families that have had this same experience and who feel helpless and who don't know uh, how to, there's so much noise here, I apologize. That, that's the, the harm of being outside in, the, in, the, in nature is that there's lots of gardening going on in the neighborhood. But I, I, I'm just so impressed and I, I, I'm really excited about this conversation. So I am Alana Odoms. I am the executive director of the ACL Louisiana. And I've been in this role for uh, almost years, uh, two years uh, in June. Actually, I took this job on my 37th birthday for fear that I might, through all of the hard work we're doing, forget when I started. So I'll never forget. In June, it will be two years. And the work of the ACLU, I think, especially in Indiana, is incredibly important because we, uh, our, our entire mission is to protect the civil rights and civil liberties of the most vulnerable people in the state of Louisiana. And once we think about uh, looking through the, the, the lens of the Bill of Rights and the lens of the Constitution, we know that these documents are not colorblind documents. We know that unfortunately in the founding of this country, people of color uh, and women were really left out of the promise of equal protection under the law. And so what the ACLU of Louisiana seeks to do is to make that promise real for vulnerable communities, all vulnerable communities, women of color, people of color, uh, the LGBTQ community, uh, folks who are serving uh, time in detention centers or immigrant uh, community, all of those people who find themselves on the margins who are disfavored, who are left out of the promise of equal protection under the law. And so we've done this in so many ways. We do it through litigation. So we challenge the government to be more fair and more just to these communities. We also challenge uh, our legislators in Congress and also in our state houses to find ways to make our laws more fair and just for all. And then in community, we work deeply with community because we know that the most uh, salient solutions to our world's most difficult problems don't come from government and they don't come from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. They come from community. They come from directly impacted families who know the intricacies of this criminal legal system and the injustice that is so embedded in it. And so we highlight the work of community and we organize around community in order to really understand how we should be working to change laws and to change policy. So I'm, I'm thrilled that we're having this conversation because I think it is through community, that lens, that we're actually able to change hearts and minds the best. And when we're thinking about art and the power that art has to teach us about humanity, to teach us about human dignity, and to teach us about the inherent worth and value that each of us have, I think that's where we get to a place where we're not just talking about statistics, where we're actually talking about change and transformation. And so I'm really excited 
to partner with you to have this conversation because I think we can talk about the laws that we're trying to change, but you can bring that home to people and really help them understand what that lived experience is like. Yeah. So, you know, I guess it's, you know, I, there's so much to talk about here and I'm really, you know, excited to talk to you about some of the work that we've done with our COVID response. So the two main campaigns that we've worked on since I've been leading the ACLU of Louisiana really center around decarceration efforts. And the reason why we focused on decarcerating our jails, prisons, and detention centers is because within our country, the founding of our country, we, we've realized that racial terror, racial control has really been deeply atomized into our country through not just uh, slavery, obviously, at the, at the beginning, but then transformed through our Jim Crow uh, laws, and then once again transformed in mass incarceration, leading our nation to be the highest incarcerator in the world. So we focused our attention really urgently on looking at how we can decarcerate jails, prisons, and detention centers. And so this work has only become more urgent at this time of the coronavirus pandemic because we know the most marginalized groups are women, African-American people, and immigrant people in our jails, prisons, and detention centers. And we know that just because you've been accused of a crime or you've been convicted of a crime, that should not be tantamount to a death sentence. And that is what our incarcerated family members and community members are facing right now in our jails, prisons, and detention centers. They do not have what they need to protect themselves from this virus. They don't have what the CDC requires by way of personal protective equipment. They are not able to social distance effectively because their, uh, their conditions are too confined. And in many instances, Jails, prisons, and detention centers that should have been closed long ago because of unconstitutional conditions of confinement, those are the same places that we are asking people to be quarantined in to try and heal themselves from this terrible, virulent virus. That is unconscionable. And so we've sued one of the epicenters of this pandemic, which is Oakdale Correctional Facilities. That is a Bureau of Prisons facility where they've now had six deaths from the coronavirus. And folks should know that this is a low level, low security uh, facility where folks are largely charged with drug offenses and, and property offenses, nonviolent offenses. The first death to take place in this uh, facility was Patrick Jones. He was charged with a drug offense and had already served 13 years. He had written to a federal judge asking to see his son who he had not seen since he was a toddler and his son is now 16 years old, and he lost his life in Oakdale Correctional Facility. And so what I wanna say is that the lawsuit that we filed against Oakdale is a lawsuit that could be filed against any facility in this country because the conditions in Oakdale are, the, are mirrored in all of our jails, prisons, and detention centers across Louisiana. Well, it's great to hear that you're focusing in the federal system because my husband was in the federal system and I feel like in some ways it's the toughest nut to crack and there's the least transparency. I don't know if that's your opinion, but um, I, I'm basically- We've experienced that. Yeah. Um, and there's also a whole lot of effort going on in, in California and I know in New York to push the governors to vastly expand clemency in this moment, and, um, I feel like it's an interesting moment to be a decarceral activist because we're really seeing connection. We're really seeing how, you know, the the deaths that happen in the prison are connected to us because you know it's the it's the COs that are going back and forth from a regular population to a prison population and, and we are not separate. And I feel like the prison systems set us up to believe that, you know, once you're bad and once you're punished, you're separate, you're discarded, you're forgotten, you don't matter. And the virus is really challenging that um, idea. So if there's any silver lining at all, it's the fact of how much we really do impact each other. And you know, I hope that it's, it's calling on the failure of this ideology of separation. 
that's something that I'm seeing in all the activist work going on here. I know tomorrow um, here in Alameda County, there's a big caravan going out to Santa Rita jail to demand, um, you know, letting people out of the county jail. And, and I know across the country, there's, you know, different gradations of that call, let everyone out, let people with six months on their, their uh, sentence out. So um, I'm really glad you guys are doing the, the heavy lifting with the lawsuits. Um, Absolutely. We're seeing exactly what you're seeing. Very little transparency in the federal system. And just to give folks at home an idea of what we're talking about, we have over 2.3 million people incarcerated in the United States. The bulk of those people, the large proportion of people are incarcerated within states and state facilities. There are about 400,000 people incarcerated in our federal system. And so we really are trying to challenge both the federal and the state uh, with regard to the way that we're moving. And so you mentioned, Joe, the activism that has to take place at the state level, and that is largely through uh, gubernatorial executive authority and the authority of the Supreme Court to be able to instruct uh, lower courts and judges on how to uh, operate with regard to folks in our pretrial system or our jail. So there's really a coordinated effort that has to happen on all of these fronts and able, and in order to be able to push on the levers that need to uh, happen in order to have folks be released in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, something that has struck me is that there's, <laughs> there's so much work to be done. Um, there are people, uh, Dorsey Nunn, for example, who've been doing this work, um, you know, for decades and decades. Um, and there's people who are just coming into it now. And um, the difference in the, the kinds and plethora of activism between when my husband went inside and when he came out is huge. The conversation, the way it's shifted is huge. And I would like to think that the work of artists is a part of that shift. I know that's true. I know yeah. that to be true. Joe, you are a part of that change. I think writers like Michelle Alexander are a part of that change. Yeah, yeah. I think artists and producers and activists like Ava DuVernay with her piece about the 13th are yeah. a part of that change. Art is so seminal to this transformation, to really changing the landscape of this discussion and, and shifting it from blame and fear to a place of policy and really understanding that, you know, what you spoke about so powerfully about human dignity and about people. There is no separation between us. We have, we have these silos that we've created, and I think they've been created uh, by government. I think they've been created by the media to help people feel, I think, more secure in their station in life. So if you, and, and we also have this grand idea of individualism in America, which I think is our biggest downfall, that we can alone pull ourselves up by our bootstraps that we through a meritocracy can earn a, a better living for ourselves and our family and that that doesn't have anything to do with our neighbor. And I think this pandemic is laying bare the, the real false, um, the falsity of all of that. It is completely false. I am as connected to the, to the people who are working to stock the grocery stores as I am connected to the people in my home. And if I don't realize that, that those, the work that they're doing to feed me and to feed my family is central to the way that we can exist. And therefore I have got to care about how they live and how they take care of their families. Then I think if we don't come out of this with any other understanding, it is that the, the interconnectedness of our society and the fact that whenever we try to isolate a group of people and put a label on them and label them as you know, non-essential, as undeserving, as, 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 as something that it should not be considered, it is exactly those people who are going to be at the heart of how we get, how we become saved. If yeah. we are able to save ourselves at all, it is the grocery workers who are saving us. It is the people who pick our food. It is the people who are caring for our loved ones who are isolated in hospitals when we can't go see them. The nurses who are doing that lots of doctors as well. It is our trash collectors. All of those people are now being termed heroes and essential where we deem them completely non-essential before and also our incarcerated people. And so I wanna know from you, Joe, 
tell me about the weight room. Tell me about how you conceived of this and how your personal lived experience inspired this particular piece for your, your production company. Mm -hmm. Well, the weight room is an evening length dance that honors the experience of women with incarcerated loved ones. Um, I really believe a few things. One is that women are the de facto re-entry system um, and that women are the primary support system to the prison industrial complex where we are being asked to be in collusion with a system that is simultaneously pulling us down. And that is a very uncomfortable position to be in. Um, I created the weight room in partnership with Essie Justice Group. Do you know Essie? Have you heard I of don't. Oh, I haven't. Okay. Essie is a really unique organization. E-S-S-I-E -S -S -E, um, was founded by Gina Clayton and Essie is the name of her grandmother or her great grandmother actually. Um, and Essie uses a healing to advocacy model for women with incarcerated loved ones. So we get together, we do a nine week cohort. I think there've been over 30 cohorts since 2015. And um, we heal as much as we can from the experience of holding this trauma in our families. And then we advocate because as you said, the people best positioned to advocate are people, people who are impacted by um, the systems, um, systemic violence, uh, the systemic violence of the prison systems themselves. Uh, so that's how the piece got going. Um, I connected with Essie out of pure emotional need when I was raising my child by myself and just really, really isolated. Um, most of the women in Essie are black women. Statistically in this country, one in four women and one in two black women have a loved one who's incarcerated. So, um, I have entered in a into a community of black leadership, of black female leadership, and I'm honored to be um, in that community and to be accepted and supported. Uh, we have a saying in Essie that her story is her story and your story is your story, and every story is valid. Um, and that's something that's been a really important ethic. And so I created the piece using the voices of Essie sisters. Um, there are six women who are interviewed, women with uh, their sons who are incarcerated, with their partners who are incarcerated, and with their fathers who are incarcerated. All of the women that I interviewed, um, the folks in their families who are incarcerated are male, um, but there are also a whole lot of women who are in the system. We just didn't happen upon those stories in our research process. So we have focused a lot on women with loved ones who are men. Um, we collected the oral histories and then I worked with a set designer and designed a set that is mobile. And unlike most of what I do, which is made for one place, I, you know, I was fully aware that incarceration is a massive American emergency. So I wanted to design a piece that could move to different communities and that could facilitate conversations like this. Um, so we've designed a set that's mobile. It um, was inspired by my own experience in the waiting rooms of prisons where you're waiting for your loved one to come out or you're in the visiting room and you're sitting in chairs that are side by side and they don't, the side by side conversations um, aren't, aren't really easy to have because like if you've got three or four people in a line, it's hard to talk. And me being a dancer and being very physical and I would say slightly hyperactive, um, I would always be standing up and moving around and I was constantly yelled at for that and told to sit in the seat. And um, so I thought, wow, the chairs are really the, the symbol for the quagmire that the prison system is. So um, we feature three chairs, we feature a clock, um, the idea and the experience of waiting. Uh, the opening line of the piece is, and so you're waiting. And um, the experience of prison is framed by waiting, whether you're inside the system or outside the system, waiting for your loved one to come home, if, if they ever do, you know, depending on their sentence. Um, 
but I tend toward a glass half full view of the world. And so I think one of the beauties of the weight room is that it's not just a spoken word piece, it's really a dance piece. And the movement is lyrical and there is flight in the piece. And we designed a set so that a dancer could fly without benefit of a structural wall or a ceiling overhead. So it's a very ingenious kind of engineering that we've created. And the set tilts around in a circle based on the labor of the women standing on the outside of it. So there's physical labor that goes into pushing the set that allows for flight. And as a group of artists, we really liked that um, interconnectedness, that the flight and the freedom and the, of the finale section of the piece comes because women are at work. Women are doing the emotional and physical labor to create freedom. And um, yeah, that's a little bit about the piece. We performed it, we premiered it in San Francisco. And oh, the other thing I'll say is that it's really designed to be in proximity to prison systems or to the impacts of incarceration. So in San Francisco, we performed it right next to the federal building where Nancy Pelosi has her office. And, wow. and then we performed it in the Richmond, which is a neighborhood in a city that is in the Bay Area and neighbor San Francisco. And we performed in a neighborhood called the Iron Triangle, which has extremely high rates of youth incarceration and youth violence. Um, and then we performed it in New York, right next to Sing Sing Prison, um, literally right next to. That was a really, really powerful experience to be literally right next to the prison. Um, and we worked with the Sing Sing Prison Museum, who were an amazing presenter for us. And now we're uh, planning on, um, we banged on the door of the CAC, working with Lori Richard. And um, Lori has had an incredible vision around understanding that a project like this happens well when there's a connection between artists and activists who are already working on these issues. And New Orleans hosts an amazing group of both artists and activists who are doing the real work of, um, you know, changing hearts and minds, illuminating for the public what incarceration is and is not, and also people like you who are working at the policy level. Um, the last thing I wanna say about the weight room is I just wanna tell two little stories about how audiences have reacted to the piece. Um, we hoped when we made the piece that half of our audiences would be people who had nothing to do with incarceration at all and people who've been systems impacted. And that really has played out. And from kind of middle class, upper middle class white women, we have heard, wow, I had no idea what women go through to support someone who's in prison because it is a lot of support. It's financial support, it's financial stress. You know, you're running a, a two income household off one income often. Um, and, and then we heard from young men of color who said, wow, I have had no idea what my mom has been going through as my brother has been in prison. And so I feel like we, we have managed to um, speak to a really uh, wide swath. that I think are really important. Uh, the fact that you're in thought partnership and community with Black women is so important when we're talking about the problem of mass incarceration because as we know, this is a problem that predominantly impacts uh, people of color uh, and in particular men of color, but we are seeing increasing numbers and have continued to see increasing numbers of women of color being rated. And so I'm, I'm so glad that this piece formed by your own lived experience, but also by the experience of black women who are doing this physical and emotional labor. And I loved the analogy that you used around uh, the fact that women are essentially this makeshift reentry community, because we know that women are obviously responsible for not just being support while a loved one is in incarcerated, but also providing that economic physical, spiritual support when a loved one returns home and faces so many of the challenges that we know incarcerated people face with regard to housing. Many people cannot, uh, they cannot get public housing. 
they cannot get public education, they cannot go back to school, they're limited in their job opportunities. And so women are really providing all kinds of opportunities for folks to be able to come home and to try to re-assimilate re, uh, into a life that has really been taken away from them. So I, I really just, I think that's so beautiful. And the fact that you're performing these pieces in proximity to prisons, just wow. I, 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 can't, I can't tell you how meaningful that will be here in Louisiana, especially where we, the world incarceration per capita, uh, we got back between us and Oklahoma, but somehow we always find a way of, of, of besting them. And so we're back in the number one uh, position again with regard to our prison population. But then with regard to our jail population, we have more people incarcerated per capita in our jails than any other place in the country. We have three times the national average of incarceration pre-trial. Those are people who are awaiting charge or trial. So essentially 15,000 Zianians who are incarcerated, who have not been convicted of any crime. That number is up 10.3% from where it was in 2015. And again, as I said, three times the national average. So there are so many people in Louisiana that have this, particular lived experience, so many women who are caring for people who have this lived experience. And this is something that can be, I believe, really liberatory for the people of this state. And also, as you said, eye-opening, because we're all within this incarceration system. It's like that analogy of like being blindfolded and touching a different part of the elephant. We are seeing it through a very limited perspective. Some of us are touching the tail. Some of us are touching the trunk. Some of us are touching the body but none of us are seeing the whole fluidity of the way that this impacts people from arrest, through pretrial incarceration, through conviction, through reentry, and then the post reentry. And so this is a really beautiful way to tell that story in a non-offensive non way. Because I think people, when you come at them with statistics about race, which we always do from the ACLU perspective, and we tell people, the research that we've done over the last two years with pretrial incarceration tells us that on average, black people are, ser are, are, are serving 36% more time incarcerated and we're more than twice as likely to be incarcerated pretrial. Yeah. For age groups 15 to five, in certain parishes, like in Orleans Parish and also certain parishes in the, the state, African-American men and boys are 19 times as likely to be incarcerated pretrial. So those kinds of numbers, I think, make people feel defensive and say, you know, but wait, this system isn't just about racism. But I think when they hear it from the, or when they see it from the perspective of art, and they see the way that these disparities happen, they are so much more open to being able to conceptualize that this system is in fact based in race. It is in fact based in wealth. It is in fact based in a lot of things that people don't generally think about. They think about guilt or innocence. And unfortunately, a lot of our criminal legal system has nothing to do with guilt or innocence. It has to do with race and it has to do with wealth and whether or not you have it. And so I'm just, I'm so excited for this piece. I'm so excited to be uh, in the audience. I'm so excited to drive people to, to go to YouTube to see Flyaway Productions and all the work that you've done, and then to welcome every Louisianian from every station in life, from every background, and to tell you that this is a, this is a performance for you. If you wanna be moved, if you wanna be changed, if you wanna learn about one of the most pressing problems in our nation and how we can start to change the narrative, then you want to see the wait room. Excellent. Well, you know, one of the things that um, that I struggle with as an artist is I feel like we have the tools to use imagination and physical language to make issues, this issue specifically, um, accessible and human. And we do that well. That's the beauty of being an artist is that we work through imagination and so um, can make people want to come see something. But then the yeah. question is when, when the proverbial curtain goes down, people always say, what can I do? 
And so I'd like to turn to you and say, tell us three things in this COVID-19 moment that people can do right now. Yeah, so there's so much that our regular everyday folks can do. And one of the ways that you can help support the work of the ACLU and other nonprofit organizations that are doing this important work around decarceration is to give and we say that you we'd love for you to become a member of the ACLU of Louisiana but you don't have to be a member to support us we'd love you to go to our website which is laaclu.org we've got incredible material on our website we have a copy of our pretrial justice report which is called justice can't wait uh, that's on the website uh, we encourage you to read that, and that would be beautiful for you to have a, a deeper understanding of the pretrial incarceration system. And there's also a petition on our website that you can sign, which is directed at our elected leaders, our governor, and the Department of Corrections to release people home as soon as possible from our, our jails and prisons. So we'd love for you to sign that petition, and we'd love for you to make your voice heard to our elected leaders on that front. And then the last thing you can do is you can actually bail somebody out. There are, there are things called bail funds and they raise money just the same way that the ACLU does through donations and they direct that money to actually bailing out people and to bring them home. We see a lot of folks who give to the bail fund uh, around holiday time, like Thanksgiving and Christmas to bring people home. But now is a more urgent time than ever with the spread of coronavirus to think about what, uh, you know, bringing people home. And so if you can donate to the bail fund, we have one here in New Orleans. There are also national bail funds. I really don't, it doesn't really matter where you give with regard to a bail fund. It's that you give and that you know that the money that you're giving is actually going to result in bringing someone home. Well, I just want to tie a couple of things together. SE Justice Group is part of the um, national bailout action that's um, Mama's Bailout. And it usually happens around Mother's Day. Um, where we bail out uh, uh, one woman, usually black women, um, you know, specifically and, and chosen um, that we focus on black women because of all the things that you said statistically. Um, but uh, so we usually choose a woman in San Francisco and one in LA where SE is co-based. Um, but because of the virus, uh, SE is moving that campaign forward to now. And um, so I think the timeliness um, have, like I know a lot of people are getting their, their stimulus check and are working yes. full time still. And so I know a lot of people are making donations with that check. And I think donating toward a bailout fund is, is just a brilliant idea. So thank you for that. Thank you so Good. much. Good. Yeah, I hope people do it. I really hope so. I'm really excited for next April and to continue to work with the CAC between now and then and to... Um, to be side by side with the work the CAC is doing to support the graduates and other artists who are part of this decarceration project that the CAC is cooking up. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the depth of working with organizations like the ACLU to get folks out and to ping pong between what you all do well and what someone like me does well. And um, yeah, I'm just really grateful for you taking the time to talk with me today. Thank you. Joe, I'm so grateful for you. And I'm going to be front row in the audience in April. I'm so <laughs> excited. As a former dancer, I was a college uh, a dancer at Rutgers University. Probably, yeah, N not, not, not very uh, good dancer. I, I was poli sci as well, just like you, poli sci in a mm -hmm. dance minor. So I think that's why I think that's why we have yeah. a, a vibe. Like there's this part of us that like is creative and wants to move but also is like really concerned about the policy yeah so I'm I, I couldn't be more excited about this I think what you're doing is phenomenal and I um I'm just really looking forward to April I'm looking forward to breaking quarantine and going to see the weight room <laughs> me too